great for us. So just appreciate it. So we are going to start a new series. Uh, Passover is soon coming. And so we like to do a little uh, series uh, usually around the uh, Passover theme. And so uh, this series is entitled Passover, A Story of Deliverance. So join me in this prayer. Uh, it should be up there on the screen. Hopefully. Can, does, is anyone here who knows how to do the PowerPoint? You can get rid of that backward screen because that screen is left over. There's a little, uh, yeah, that gets rid of the screen. Oop, well, we got rid of everything. Ah, there we go. There's a little mm, neon light. So let's pray this prayer. Avinu Malkinu, our Father and our King, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to perceive, and the will to obey your word that I hear today in Yeshua's name. Amen. So as I said, we're starting this uh, four-week Passover series on the theme of deliverance, and I really believe that Adonai wants to encourage us that he is the great deliverer, uh, even as we sung in the song, one of the songs that we brought in recently that I love, you know, there is, you have no rival, there is no equal to you in Gary's Devar Torah, you know, the Kohen Haggadol and the Torah had no power to change uh, the life of the person with Sarat, but the Kohen Haggadol, Yeshua, the great, great high priest can, because he's all powerful, he is our deliverer. And as he delivered the Israelites from ancient Egypt and the uh, hands of their oppressor, God desires to deliver you and me from the forces of darkness that would seek to keep us in bondage. And I just want to share a story that I came across uh, that uh, had been a while since I had heard this story. Uh, and it was about an emissary who was uh, in the New Hebrides Islands, and he was there bringing the good news of Yeshua to uh, these people. And one night, uh, hostile natives from the island surrounded uh, the place where he and his wife were, and they were intent on burning them out. The uh, emissary's name was John Patton, and killing him. So Patton and his wife uh, prayed uh, diligently, obviously, during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them. And when daylight came, they were surprised and amazed to see that their attackers uh, left. And a year later, the chief of the tribe actually came to faith in Yeshua as his his Messiah. And so uh, Patton asked the chief what had kept him from burning down the house that night and killing him. And the chief replied in surprise, who were all those men with you there? Peyton knew that there were no men pres present, but the chief said he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds, hear me, hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords circling the house. That, my friends, is the God of deliverance who you and I serve. Amen. He's a God of deliverance. And even though you and I may not be able to see it, he has the host of heavens assigned to protect and to deliver us from every evil attack of darkness that would rage against us. And a story like that, yes, Sandy should put goosebumps on you, but more than that, encourage you, because that is the same God that you and I serve. He is our great deliverer. So our text for this series is from Shemot, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 20. So we're going to read this, and I don't normally do this, but I like you to read it out loud with me, okay? So the words are up there, and I know Randy's very good at keeping up with us, and I'll try not to read too, sly, uh, too fast. So, together, please. Adonai spoke to Moshe and Aharon in the land of Egypt. He said, You are to begin your calendar with this month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Speak to all the assembly of Israel and say, On the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb or kid for his family, one per household. Except that if the household is too small for a whole lamb or kid, then he and his next door neighbor should share one, dividing it in proportion to the number of people eating it. 
Your animal must be without defect, a male in its first year, and you may choose it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it at dusk. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the two sides and top of the door frame at the entrance to the house in which they eat it. That night they are to eat the meat roasted in the fire. They are to eat it with matzah and maror. Don't eat it raw or boiled, but roast it in the fire with its head, the lower parts of its legs, and its inner organs. Let nothing of it remain till morning. If any of it does remain, burn it up completely. Here is how you are to eat it, with your belt fastened, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you are to eat it hurriedly. It is Adonai's Pesach, Passover. For that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and animals, and I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am Adonai. The blood will serve you as a sign marking the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over. The Hebrew word there is Pesach. I will pass over you. When I strike the land of Egypt, the death blow will not strike you. This will be a day for you to remember and celebrate as a festival to Adonai. From generation to generation, you are to celebrate it by a perpetual regulation. For seven days, you are to eat matzah. On the first day, you remove the leaven from your houses. For whoever eats chamatz, leavened bread, from the first to the seventh day is to be cut off from Yisrael. On the first and seventh days, you are to have an assembly set aside for God. On these days no work is to be done except what each must do to prepare his food. You may do only that. You are to observe the festival of Matzah, for on this very day I brought your divisions out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you are to observe this day from generation to generation by perpetual regulation. From the evening of the 14th day of the first month until the evening of the 21st day, you are to eat matzah. During those seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. Whoever eats matzah, with, eats food with chametz in it, is to be cut off from the community of Israel. It doesn't matter whether he is a foreigner or a citizen of the land. Eat nothing with chametz in it. Wherever you live, eat matzah. Amen. I've already started buying my matzah, and my husband already started eating matzah a month early. So, so from this passage, we're going to look at four steps that are part of the process of our deliverance. Three of these are related to our responsibilities, and one of them is to Adonai's responsibility. Adonai has the hardest part, supernatural. Okay? I'm going to tell you, he's got his part down. <laughs> Like the, the, the emissary there in Hebrides Island, he had them covered. So God's got his part down. We have to just do our part. So the first point is readiness from verse 11, that we need to have a heart filled with expectation. The second point is redemption, understanding the power of the blood in verse 13. Uh, the fourth one will be removal of sin, uh, living a life of holiness, getting rid of all the chametz. And the uh, fourth one is remembrance, passing on to the next generation and breaking generational curses is what I think that applies to what God would like to speak to us about in this series. But today we're going to focus on verse 11 uh, and the message today is entitled, Are You Ready for Your Deliverance? Deliverance. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready for your deliverance? So let's read that verse again. Here is how you are to eat it with your belt fastened, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you are to eat it hurriedly. It is Adonai's Pesach or Passover. I don't know about you, but I don't like eating my food in a hurry. Uh, sometimes our schedules are a little hectic. 
and I feel like I'm shoveling my food down and sometimes I'll say to my family, just give me space. <laughs> okay, you know, it's, they have to get out the door or they need my attention, this like this, because I hate that feeling of like shoveling my food down and get, you know, just because I have to go on to something else. It's never a good experience. The emphasis on this verse is not just on eating hurriedly, though, uh, but that they must be prepared for what is about to take place. When most of us eat, we're sitting back, uh, relaxed, casual manner, and we're not thinking about what we're going to do next. Al and I was telling the children of Israel, and I believe he wants to speak to us here at Beth Emanuel and Passover 2019 to be ready because deliverance was coming. He was saying, don't sit down, don't get comfortable, have your marching shoes on, your staff in your hand, and your belt on, and ready to get out of this bondage that hell has placed on you. Now, we have the privilege of looking back and knowing the end of the story. The children of Israel, you can say, oh, that was easy, of course, for them to do. I don't think it was so easy. My husband and I were talking about this yesterday. They had been in Egypt for over 400 years. Probably about eight to 10 generations had lived there. I don't think it was so easy to have uh, expectation that it was finally going to happen. When you've waited and waited and waited and one generation passes and the second passes and the third and the fourth and you hear the, the, the promise, God made this promise to our people, he's going to bring us out, he's going to bring us out. And then this guy Moshe shows up and when he shows up, it gets worse for you. Hello? And now he's saying to you, God says, get ready. To, deliverance is coming. I think they struggled with that. It's ha hard to have faith and expectation when the shackles are getting tighter, when the weights are getting heavier, and when the pain is becoming more unbearable. In fact, I can assure you that your enemy, like Pharaoh, will do his best to beat you down, wear you out, and make you feel hopeless so that you give up any sign of expectation or hope for deliverance. Adonai knew this, and we read earlier in the book of Shemot when Moses came, Moshe came and he said, I'm going, God's going to do this in the four promises which we spoke from last year. And it says that the children of Israel couldn't receive what Moshe said because they were so discouraged. Some of you are so discouraged about life, about situations that you have hoped for, that you have prayed for, and that you see no release, uh, and have seen no release, and you don't see anything in sight in the natural eye. And discouragement is there, so it's hard to receive a message like this or to stand on the promises of God because that is weighing down on you. But I want to encourage you today, Adonai is saying, Beth Emanuel, get ready. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready. Get ready, God says. I'm going to bring you out from under the weights of darkness and into that wide open spacious place that I have prepared for you. Amen? This is the promise he gives to us. God declares that he has his army surrounding you in the face of the darkness and that as you stand firm in your faith, the enemy will cower just like those uh, natives covering, uh, surrounding that uh, emissary's house. And he wants you to know that the enemy will cower before the power of God Almighty who stands ready to intervene in your situation. My little brother, Pastor Ralph, often says this. I can hear it in my, in my mind. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready. God's word for us today is get ready. If you remember nothing else from this message, I hope you remember that. Get ready because God wants to do something. And he wants to encourage you that he's going on the move and that things are going to change in your life. So what has been the norm for you will instantly 
Can you say instantly? Instantly be gone. Instantly be gone as you walk in the newness of life that he has prepared for you. Listen to me. This means depression will be replaced with a spirit of encouragement. Joy will push out the heaviness. Health will drive out sickness. Peace of mind will dispel torment. Can I get an amen? Do you hear what God is saying? Deliverance is coming. I am the great I am. I am your deliverer. And as we prepare our homes for Passover, and I'd hoped to start a major cleaning while I was off, but I have to confess, I did not. <laughs> I did get my laundry all done at the very beginning, and that was nice. And bought some stuff to clean, but it's sitting on the kitchen floor. As we prepare our homes in the natural, God is encouraging us to prepare our spiritual hearts, our minds, and our spirit for the Passover deliverance that Adonai wants each of us to experience. As I was preparing this message, the words of a famous song from that animated movie, Prince of Egypt, which gets a lot of things wrong biblically, but it's still a good movie, came to mind, and the words are, the hope is frail, it's hard to kill. I want to encourage you, let hope, which is expectation and which is always tied to faith, rise in your heart and prepare yourselves for deliverance that God wants to bring into your life. I don't care how thin that thread of hope is in your heart right now. And like I said, I understand that many of you feel weighed down, you feel discouraged, you're disappointed because things are not what you thought they would be. And you have been praying and you have been standing and it looks like, let me say that, it looks like God has not answered. Over 400 years for Israel, it looked like God was not moving. And I get it. And so it may be a thin, thin thread. But I'm telling you, wrap that thread around your finger as tight as you can. And do not let go of that thread of hope and expectation. Because God is on the move. God is on the move. Amen. And I know it's not easy to do. You will never, ever be able to ready yourself if you give up in your heart. It's not easy because our emotions can be so strong. I can tell you the last few days, my emotions have been all over the place, personally, leading me to uh, this feeling of despair and of wanting to give up even. And what did I do? I had to push past those feelings push past those emotions to that place of hope and expectation in the God who I love and who I know loves me more than I could ever, ever imagine. So those emotions that were raging, that was driving me to a place where I did not want to be, were emotions that I had to push past. And come to that place of he is my God. As we sung today again, there is no rival. He is God Almighty, and he loves me. The other song we sang today, we're here for one reason and one reason only. That's to love you, God, and to receive your love. And when I push my emotions past that despair and hopelessness to that place of his love for me. My situation that doesn't change, but I change. And that hope and that expectation rises in my heart. I wrote in my devotional journey yesterday, God, I don't want, want to waller around in self-pity. Your waller is that Midwestern word. You're like the pigs waller in the mud. This is a good word for some of us. Stop wallowing around like the pigs. Okay? Stop it. Rise up. 
with hope and expectation because you serve a great and awesome God. And I don't care what has not happened up to today. I know that he is a God of great and mighty power and that he wants to deliver you and me, this congregation, your family, whatever the situation is, and bring you to that place that he has prepared for you. Amen. Ephesians 6.14 says, Therefore, stand. Stand to your feet right now. Therefore, stand. Have the belt of truth buckled around your waist and put on righteousness for a breastplate. You may be seated. <laughs> An imagery, stand. Again, why? Because some of us are wallowing around in the mud and God says, get up. Get up. The same Greek word here used in the Ephesians is used in the Septuagint translation of the Torah. Just a brief history lesson for those who may not know or may not remember, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that took place before the time of Messiah. So uh, Septuagint means 70, and tradition says 70 elders got together and translated. We're not sure exactly how many people did that, but it's a Greek translation before the time of Messiah. So there in Exodus, when it says to uh, gird up your waist, it's the same Greek word used in Ephesians 6.14. that says, Has the, have the belt of truth buckled, that word buckled around. And this Greek word is uh, peritsunumni, and what it means is to gird yourself in preparation for activity. Figuratively, it speaks of readiness for activity, while ungirding would mean that you are uh, getting ready to to rest. And in the New Covenant time period, and especially when Rav Shaul is using it here in Ephesians 6, it pictures the custom uh, of a, a soldier especially. But in the ancient world, we know they had these flowing garments. And so to gird up uh, was to take those uh, garments and to wrap them up around your belt so that you could get ready for what you needed to do because it's hard to move about with these flowing garments. And for a soldier, uh, they would wrap that up and then they would have have their sword, their scabbard uh, in their belt, ready for action and ready for uh, combat. The other thing about this word, uh, grammatically speaking, for anyone who wants to bone up on your Greek grammar, it's in the middle voice. What does that mean, Rabbi Carol? It means you had to do it for yourself. Hello? You have to do it for yourself. I can't get you ready, okay? You can't get me ready. No one could get me out of the funk where I was at in the last couple days. I sat down yesterday, I said to my husband, I, I, and he could tell, and, and I said, I feel like crying. I said, but I can't tell you, because I didn't want to impact him with my emotions and things. I had to get myself out of there. I had to gird myself up. This is what God is telling us. You need to get yourself ready. Get ready for what God wants to do. The similar, uh, similar, similar imagery is used by Kepha. In Kepha Allah, 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, get your minds ready for work. Keep yourselves under control and fix your hope fully on the gift you will receive when Yeshua the Messiah is revealed. So one author writing on this verse says it has an excellent practical comment. It is not physical exertion that Kepha has in mind here, but mental. If the pur purpose of girding up the clothing was to get ready, or was to put out of the way that which might impede the physical progress of an individual, the girding of the mind would be putting out of the mind all that would impede the free action of the mind in connection with the onward progress of the believer's experience. Things such as worry, fear, jealousy, hate, unforgiveness, and impurity. He went on to say that these thoughts harbored in the mind prevent the Holy Spirit from using the mental faculties of the believer in the most efficient manner. And thus causing that believer to uh, not grow in spiritual life and make progress. And so the word 
also, he says, is in the aorist tense, grammar, what does that mean? It means it has been done once and for all. In other words, we have to take this stand and not fall back, but do it and do it with resolve. I've made my stand. I'm girding myself up, and I am getting ready. I have expectation that God is going to move. And the writer of Hebrews tells us, don't shrink back like those who think they're shrinking back to safety. It says to stand up, because when you shrink back, you think you're shrinking back into safety, but you're not. So God is encouraging us. Take your stand, get ready, gird yourself, because I am ready to move and to bring deliverance. Hope and expectation is tied to our faith, and the battle for that is always waged in our mind. I want to encourage you this morning, do not let your mind control your thoughts but through the hope, help of the Ruach you control your thoughts and bring them into obedience to who Messiah Yeshua is. Again we sang it in our worship today. He has no rival. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. There is no one like him and whatever thoughts are in your mind needs to come into submission and into alignment with who God is. The great I am, the great deliverer who has this army surrounding this place right now, this host assigned to you to bring you through and out of the darkness that would seek to hold you back. Faith, hope, expectation is what we need to grab hold of right now in order to get ourselves ready for the deliverance that God is about to bring into our lives. Amen. One writer said this, to have faith means to have a mindset that expects God to act. She went on to say the Bible is full of promises where God tells us he will do something. And the only thing we have to do is take him at his word and believe. And believe. Believe. That's what expectation is about. Think of uh, Abraham, Romans 4. Abraham, against all hope, hoped. He did not waver in doubt and unbelief, even though he reckoned with the fact that his body was dead and Sarah's was no better. Faith, expectation, doesn't deny things are bad, but it goes beyond those to the God who made a promise, to the God who fulfills his word. We say it every week, not one word of your promises are unfulfilled. So why can I rise up in hope and expectation? Why can I pull myself out of funky attitude? Because I know the God that I serve is a God who always, always, always keeps his promises. And my hope and expectation is in him, not in myself, not in my circumstances, not in anyone else. Adonai was telling the Israelites, and he is telling us today, to expect him to move on our behalf. He wants you to get it in your kishkas that he is your deliverer, and that he is working right now behind the scenes, even though you cannot see him. So what do you do when you expect someone? You get ready for them. While we were off the, uh, the last week and a half or so, uh, we had Michael's sister and brother-in-law over for brunch one morning. So what did we do? The day before, we cleaned our house. That was a good thing to do. And then that morning, they were coming around 10.30. What did we do? We got up. My husband went out and bought the bagels. And yes, he got donuts. Okay. And uh, I got all my stuff ready to cook. And we waited for them to arrive. So we readied the house. We got the food ready. Ready. Why? Because we were expecting them to show up. And they showed up on time, which is unusual. And even his sister, his sister said that. We're actually on time today. We expected them to show up. When you expect God to show up, you will ready yourself. Let's look at a couple other scriptures where the same uh, Greek word is used. 
in the Septuagint of Melachim Bet, 2 Kings 9, 1. Elisha the prophet summoned one of the guild prophets and said to him, prepare, that's the same word, prepare for traveling. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramat Gilad. If we go ahead and read through the, the rest of that chapter, what was about to take place is Jehu is going to be anointed as king. Why is that important? Because God used Jehu to... <coughs> excuse me, to defeat uh, Jezebel and Ahab and to wipe wickedness out of the land. So God was about to do something awesome for the land of Israel. And it happened by Elijah telling a servant to get yourself ready and get going to anoint this new king. <coughs> Acts chapter 12, verse 8. This is the story of Cave who's in jail. <coughs> and the angel said to him, Put on your clothes, get ready, and your sandals. And he did. Throw on your robe, he said, and follow me. Cave was about to be delivered, but the angel told him, Get ready. You're about to deliver, and God's word to you today is, Get ready. He had a get out of jail free card. But Kepha had to move himself. The angel didn't pick him up and carry him out. The angel didn't just snap his fingers and transport Kepha to another place in the city, which the angel could have done. Right? But the angel told Kepha, get up, get ready, follow me. Get out of jail free, but you still have to do something. And that's what God is speaking to us. He's got the supernatural done. Therefore, Kepha miraculously went past all those guards. They didn't see them. That was the whole supernatural thing. But Kepha still had to cooperate. And so it is for you and I. Get ready for what God wants to do. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. It's the Shunammite and her son, and her son has died. And it says, Elisha said to Gehazi, get dressed for action. There's that word, get ready. Take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, don't greet them. If anyone greets you, don't answer and lay my staff on the child's faith. Death was about to meet the resurrection power of God Almighty. Amen. But somebody had to get ready. Somebody had to gird themselves up. God wants to know if there's a somebody here today that is going to get ready for what he wants to do so that that resurrection power can breathe life into that dead situation that you are facing in your family. In all of these instances, the people had to prepare themselves for action and then to act. Adonai was going to bring deliverance, but it required their cooperation. They had to move, and the only way they could move was because they expected that God was going to do something. Get ready yourself. As I said before, don't wall around in self-pity. Passover speaks of deliverance, and God wants to encourage us today to expect our deliverance. So as I close, I want to talk about application. Two things in applying this message. First is change your mindset. Change your mindset. How are you going to do that? Get rid of pity, doubt, and unbelief. Like I said, some of you are walling around in self-pity. Get out of the mud. Some of you are letting doubt and unbelief bombard because you have been waiting, and it's not 400 years, okay? But it's been a long time. And you have been praying and praying and saying, God, this is the promise that you gave, and I'm standing on your promise. And you have been praying and praying, and sometimes doubt and unbelief wants to just captivate your heart and your mind. And God says, get rid of that doubt and unbelief. Be like Abraham there in Romans 4, and I encourage you to go read that chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters to preach from. But Abraham refused 
refused to give in to doubt and unbelief. He understood how desperate the situation was and that in the natural, he and Sarah would never ever have a child, but he hoped against hope. God is saying to you this morning, hope against hope. I don't care how desperate the situation seems. I don't care how many years, months, weeks you have been waiting for this promise. Push out doubt and unbelief. Grab hold of faith and expectation. Secondly, is to stand on the truth of God's word. I get it, your feelings might be strong. As I said, I went through something the last week that was not very fun. I hate when this happens. The thing to pull you out is to go to the truth in God's word. Not your feelings. I don't care how strong they are and how real they are, but you have to line yourself up with what does God say in his word. Basic discipleship 101, and yet so many believers are not in the word. Friends, I want to tell you, this better be a year where you get some of these basic disciplines down once and for all. You know, that you are a man and a woman of the word, that you are in the word and the word is in you, so that when those fiery darts of hell of doubt and unbelief come to attack your mind, you are able to instantly raise up that shield of faith and to stop every single one. Get your mind ready by being in the word of God. Build your faith. How? Through the word and also through praying in the spirit. We are told in the new covenant, build your faith by praying in the spirit. You know, after Passover, we're going to be looking towards Shavuot, which is at time of the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. We pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We are a spirit-filled, believing congregation. And some of you need to start praying in that heavenly language, even when I'm went into the prayer room this morning. P.S. You can join our prayer team from 10 to 10.30. So I woke up uh, and my ears were clogged, not only clogged, but I had pain in my ears. So I went in to pray. Thank you. My ears are doing better. And as Rena was leading in prayer and Kathy praying and then Lucia began to pray in tongues, it so encouraged my heart to hear her praying in tongues because we need to activate our faith and praying in the spirit is a good way to do that. Also, I posted a month or so ago, there's health benefits to praying in the spirit. A study was done at a university, so that's just an extra thing. And if you have not been filled with the Ruach, with the evidence of speaking in tongue, I want to tell tell you this is your year. You don't have to wait till Passover. It can happen today. I've showed the story uh, of the man from the congregation I grew up in who we prayed for years and years. His wife attended and we prayed for his salvation and he finally became a believer. And how excited. And then he wanted to be filled with the Ruach and he came up every time for prayer and, and it just wasn't happening. And then one week he came to service he said I was home. I was in my bathtub. The Holy Spirit hit me and I begin to speak in other tongues. God wants you to have that gift of the Holy Spirit and that is one of the ways that we build our faith up. And the other thing is to have expectation that God will act. Change your mind. Change your mind. Expect God to move. Be like that little child. Right? He says that if we want to come into the kingdom of God, we need to be like little children. Why? Because children, they don't have doubt and unbelief. That's when you see see these little kids and their father is standing there and say, they say, jump. What happens? The kid just jumps because they expect that the father's going to catch them, right? I love watching Tim with his little daughter sometimes. I'm standing here, I'm like, he's throwing her up. <laughs> and she, has, she is like, she trusts that dad's going to catch. That's the thing we have to have. Expect that God's going to move. Expect that he's going to act. Expect that he's going to bring deliverance. That your child's going to be saved. That your marriage is going to be restored. That your finances are going to be uh, better. Expect God to move. Change your mindset. So change your mindset. Second thing, and then we'll go eat bagels. Okay, well, I'm not eating bagels today, but you can eat bagels. Second thing is to act on your expectation. How do we do that? Do whatever he tells you to do. 
Do whatever he tells you to do. I was thinking of the story of these servants at the uh, wedding in Canaan. When Yeshua came, now this is the first recorded miracle of Yeshua. So Yeshua doesn't have a track record yes, yet. Okay, so just think about this. So Miriam's word to the servants is, do whatever he tells you to do. So Yeshua says, fill these bottles up, not bottles, but these huge uh, you know, pots with water. Okay. Now take them and serve the master who has just asked for wine. I took a lot of faith on the part of those servants. There had to be something about Yeshua that they knew that they knew that this man is not from this world. Okay? Not because they had seen him perform miracles. See, it would have been different if this was a year into his ministry and Yeshua has this track record. But think of how awesome it is that they actually did what Yeshua told them to do and they carried those jugs of water and served it and it was the best wine that they'd ever drank. So, act on your faith and expectation. Do whatever God tells you to do, no matter how silly it may seem. Just got to park here for a minute. Think about Joshua going around the walls of Jericho. Get the Veggie Tale version. It's great. Those little peas up there, you know, with a French accent. <laughs> Okay, a little, you know, poetic license there. Did that make sense at all? Go march around this wall seven days and say absolutely nothing? And on that seventh day, march around seven times and then blow the shofars? What, did, what, what do you mean, God? Yet it was exactly what needed to be done. So Joshua and the children of Israel acted on their faith and their expectation that God was going to deliver Jericho in their, into their hands. Do whatever God tells you to do. Secondly is walk in obedience to the principles of the Bible. Basic, but i got to say it. Friends, if you're ignoring godly principles, you can hope and wish till you're blue in the face. It ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. You have to follow the principles of the Word of God. You have to do what the Word tells you to do. You want a strong marriage? Keep the toes out. I'm coming. Husbands? Love your wife as Messiah loved the Kehillah. Okay, every man here, look at me. I'm your rabbi, I'm your spiritual mom. I'm going to tell you. you. And I've told you this before. You have a bigger burden on you in that marriage. You're the initiator of the covenant. And you need to love your wife as Messiah loved the Kehillah. Wives, you're not off the hook. You submit to him as you're submitting to the Lord. See, those biblical principles, you can pray for a good marriage, but if you don't do those things, not going to happen. Ooh, we like the message up to this point, huh? <laughs> biblical principles have to be followed. Okay? You want financial blessing? Keep the feet out. We shared it. Her and Adeline both got check, Adeline from three years ago, uh, something she paid. It wasn't a large check, but it's still an unexpected check. They're faithful in tithing and giving to the congregation. It's not for my benefit, it's for your benefit. He says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing that cannot be contained. Number three, under, act on your expectation, and I'll have two more. Thank God, they said. <laughs> Another tough one, but I love you, and I've been on vacation, so. Get rid of compromise in your life. The glory of God cannot be mixed with the profane. I don't care what you are doing in your mind to justify it. 
God's glory will not mix with the profane. Any area of your life where you have compromised the good news is today, you can change that. So many times we compromise because we feel pressure from family, from our loved ones. We don't want to get them upset. We don't want, you know, to, you know what will happen if, they, if I don't do this. A lot of us, especially with our children, I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you. The glory will never mix with the profane. Don't compromise in your life in any area. That's how you're going to act on your faith. I'll leave the rest up to God. Finally, follow the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh. The angel came in to Kepha in the, in the jail and said, follow me. God's going to say, follow me. Deliverance is, is yours. Follow me. The man who I told you about at the beginning, he and his wife, they followed God to a land that was not their own, to share the good news with the people who were not their own. And because they followed God and the leading of the Holy Spirit, God sent those mighty warriors dressed in white with their swords drawn to protect them from those who sought to kill their lives and to burn the house down. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as you do, God will bring deliverance into your life. So as we apply these principles, what we are doing is align ourselves with the purposes of plans of God, which will bring deliverance into our situation. So God wants us to say goodbye to the chains and hello to freedom this year. Say goodbye to Egypt and hello to the promised land, because that's where God wants to bring us today. Let's stand to our feet again as we close with the ironic benediction. In these last words, get ready, get ready. Your deliverance is coming. Amen. Bless you, Yevarecha Ka Adonai Vishmereka. Me Adonai bless you and keep you. Ya er Adonai Panavaleka Vihunecha. Me Adonai make his face shine on you and show you his favor. Isa Adonai Panavaleka Vyasim Lecha Shalom. Me Adonai lift up his face toward you and give you peace. May you walk in the peace of God Almighty. May expectation and faith and hope rise in your heart this week as you get ready for what God is going to do. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you 